You know, we've been on quite an interesting journey this Lenten season, and I'm not just talking about this COVID-19 pandemic. While yes, this time of international in this time of international crisis, we have encountered an understanding of living that none of us, I imagine, any of us expected to be in. I imagine uh, that many of us have experienced a very different Lent than many of us had probably planned to do. But Lent in general tends to push us. It tends to push the limits of our spiritual, our cultural, and, and even our physical comfortability. I have, I've seen all of, uh, I've seen friends, I've seen colleagues, I've seen memes online that said, I didn't quite expect to give up this much this Lent, right? And I think when we all gathered together uh, about, uh, what's, oh gosh, what's it been, like a month, I think, that we've been in Lent? Oh dear, <laughs> none of us expected that we'd be giving up quite this much in Lent, this sentiment brings to mind the idea of fasting and sacrifice when it comes to living out our faith. We have been somewhat forced into an interestingly into an interesting fast that is very much testing the way in which we live out our faith. It's testing and transforming the way in which we understand who we are as the church. And hopefully we look to come out of the other end maybe appreciating more the things that we have and the practices of our faith that ground us in this time. And so we've been walking through this Lenten season. We've been walking through this understanding of the mess that's in our lives. This mess that distorts and distracts the image of God that lives within us. We wrestled with sin and the nature of sin. We started the first week by looking at that image of God that we are told we are created in and the ways in which that image can become distorted, can become rejected. And we wrestled with that nature in our lives. We wrestled with not only our recognition of sin, but our repentance and confession that help us to reorient our lives towards the divine image that we are created in. In, in that justification, we begin to understand that the surrender that takes place in our hearts and in our souls that empties us and prepares us, and, and opens us up to the work that God is looking to do within us. We put away the whole self, the old self, and take on this mantle of new birth as we reorient our lives, but even more so that we change our posture towards God. And we are reminded of that posture. We are reminded of the way that God's posture never changes. The way that God's posture is always that of reaching out to us, seeking to in, engage us, seeking to love us, seeking to give us his grace, offering us love and grace, even when we can't, even when we don't even recognize it, even when we don't even offer it in return. And so where do we move today? Today, we address the mess. Today we address the mess. God does not remove the problem in our lives. In fact, somewhat unfortunately, a relationship with God often might reveal more problems about ourselves than we may have previously thought. But it is God's nature of grace God's nature of healing and transformation, God's nature of restoration and redemption in our lives that help us, that help us to address the mess and do the work of revealing the image of God that has always resided within us. In our Wesleyan tradition, this idea is known as, a sanctifying grace. 
This is the way in which God continues to make us perfect, in which God continues to work within us each and every day as we seek to learn and to grow and to be made whole in God's love and God's grace, as we seek this idea of perfection. Tom Berlin writes, the transformation that God makes possible in our own lives takes place through sanctifying grace. Provenient grace is God's work in our lives before we are even aware of it. Justifying grace seeks to show us who we are and where we fall short. And sanctifying grace works on us and with us to restore the image of God in our lives. This work comes through intentional and disciplined relationship with God. This work comes by focusing our hearts on the healing work God is doing in us. It does not work if we have not done that work of confession, of repentance, or of surrender. It does not work if we have not done this work we have talked about. But even more so, it does not work if we become distracted If we become distracted, then we become focused on selfish ambitions. Even while we may feel we remain connected to God, this work is meant to be difficult. It's meant to actually be something that we have to intentionally focus our hearts and our minds on as we do it. Just as any relationship in our lives takes hard work to maintain. Just as my relationship with my friends and family takes work to maintain. To maintain, so too does our relationship with God take work on our behalf, takes engagement on our behalf in order to maintain, in order to strengthen, and in order to build. And we begin to hear that nuanced understanding of sanctifying grace. As we read in our scripture passage today about how Jesus is engaged with Mary and with Martha. And the differences in which they engage with Jesus. Mary and Martha have both welcomed Jesus into their home. And upon Jesus' arrival, Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and begins to learn. And engages in this learning. However, Martha continues to work. And we read in this text today, Luke tells us in verse 40, But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. Imagine yourself so distracted by the tasks of life that when Jesus gives you an opportunity, you are not willing to take it to sit down and listen even for a few minutes. You see, distraction and faith can impede on God's grace working in our life. When our attention turns away from God and we become distracted too much, we neglect the spiritual growth that must occur. It is not that Martha is displaying bad etiquette in terms of welcoming a guest. In fact, many of us would applaud Martha. That she is seeking when Jesus is in her home to offer him a meal, to offer him comfort while he is there. But you see, her anger towards Mary is misdirected. Because as Jesus tells us in our passage, that Martha has chosen the better part of what is necessary. That Martha has chosen in this time to sit and to be with Jesus. We consider the time that Martha takes to learn, to glean, to grow in her faith by sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening. And we look and see how Martha's distraction, yes, while applauded, takes her away from an opportunity to learn and grow herself in her faith. I feel many of us may feel like Martha. We become distracted in our faith and we become filled with all the the work that we think needs to be done. 
And we forget about the discipline of living, of learning, of loving, and of just being in relationship with God. And to think about what that means. If we consider justification to be God's great act of grace, then why would we think that it would stop there? If we think about justification as the end of the story, then we neglect the therapeutic and the healing work of sanctification and grace. We neglect to think of the ways in which God invites us. The way that we have taken on and said, God, I confess, I repent, I surrender. I want to be wholly a part of this relationship with you. And then we think that that's the end of the story. And so we become then unwilling to do the work of sanctification. We become unwilling to take part in the work of sanctification. Jesus responds to Martha's complaint about Mary not helping by saying, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. And Tom Berlin in his book tells us we are distracted. Jesus tells us that just one thing is needed, time with him. That's why you and I need spiritual disciplines. The word never recalled, the world never recalled what Martha served for dinner. But we all remember Jesus' message that Martha, that sorry, that Mary made the wiser choice. How much grace and nuance exists in those responses. The response is to Martha's concern about Mary. See, Martha becomes so distracted that she cannot even fathom why Mary is sitting and listening to Jesus instead of helping her prepare this meal for the ones that they have welcomed into their home. We must have the discipline ourselves to focus on these tasks of spiritual growth. In the church, we call them spiritual disciplines. Our focus on these is what leads to this growth. These are the opportunities that we take to sit at the feet of Jesus, to sit at the feet of our Lord and to listen to what he is saying. John Wesley had a wonderfully beautiful term for a lot of these. And he often called them means of grace. Hear that again, these acts, these practices, means of grace. And as we learn, he often understood these as the ways God works invisibly in disciples, hastening, strengthening, and confirming faith. So that God's grace pervades in and through disciples. That is from our denomination as they have unpacked the theology of John Wesley. That that is what Wesley understood these means of grace to be. And I think that we can consider even more simply in part the ways in which God perfects us in his grace. To live into this understanding of sanctifying grace means that we seek these opportunities of spiritual discipline and and actively engage in our relationship with God through these means of grace. That this is the ways in which we practice our faith. Simply put. Right? We have we have followed through this journey. We know that grace is not linear, and so these means of grace are not particularly ways in which we experience God's sanctifying grace. These are just ways in which we experience God's grace. They are reminders of ways in which God works within us. They are reminders in which God has 
place within us a desire to love and to have compassion upon us, the ways in which God has justified us. But these are ways in which we experience God's grace. And when we enter into these practices... Now, Wesley divided these means of grace into two large categories. He called them works of piety and works of mercy. And then each of these large categories had two subcategories. Both of them had a personal aspect and a social aspect. In thinking about the ways in which we sit at the feet of God and truly learn, grow, and heal from the mess in our lives... I want us to examine these personal and social piety, these acts of personal and social piety that he talked about, that Wesley puts forth, these acts that involve discipline, that involve focus, and our attention being focused upon God during certain times in our lives. These ways in which we engage in these spiritual disciplines. And so when Wesley talks about works of piety, he thinks individual practices. He considers reading, meditating, and studying the scriptures, prayer, fasting, regularly attending worship, healthy living, and even sharing our faith with others. And communally, he considered the the regular sharing of the sacraments. Acts of Christian conferencing, that is accountability to one another, gathering together, and even Bible study. These acts both that impact us individually and that impact us corporately. These acts are disciplines that draw us closer to God, that help us to do the work of healing and transformation we have been talking about. And it's not that those acts of mercy don't help to do that. They do. And these are acts of engaging in social justice and and giving and being in mission with one another. But it is even more so these works of piety that help us to intentionally engage with God, to sit at the feet of Christ and to learn and to grow Right? Piousness is this understanding of growing in God. Again, from from Tom Berlin's book, Restored, he says the goal of a sanctified life is to express perfect love in every situation. How can we express perfect love if we are not willing to sit in the presence of it? How can we express perfect love if we are not cons- if we are constantly distracted if we are constantly running around doing everything else How can we express perfect love if we are not willing to put in the work again how can we express perfect love if we are not willing to sit in the presence of that which is perfect Again, I'm not saying any of this is going to be easy. But just like I reminded you last week, it is work that is worth doing. Because as we continue to live our faith, we continue to learn and to grow in God's love, and we deepen our relationship with our Creator. We do that healing and transformative work that God has called each and every one of us to do. And that God will do in each and every one of us as we seek to live holy in who God calls us to be. And so as you think about these practices this week, this is your focus of the week, your homework. I want you to consider in your life, what in your life are activities that bring you closer to God? I listed a few earlier in this sermon. Prayer. Reading, studying, meditating on scripture, joining for corporate worship like this, living a healthy life, sharing our faith with others, engaging in Bible study, sharing the sacraments, which I will talk about a way in which we will share the sacraments later, but we'll get to it. Accountability with one another in our Christian community. But there are more. There are other ways in which we can seek to engage with our creator And then how are you using those practices? 
to help in that healing and restorative work that God promises to do within each and every one of us. As God addresses this mess, we have to wholly surrender to God by taking part in these rituals and in these actions of personal piety as they are described in our faith. If we are not, then are we not merely those who just say the right words but aren't willing to actually do the real work to truly make this relationship with God all that it can be? This is the hard work of faith. This is the relationship that God wants to have with each and every one of us. And when we go through this process of addressing the mess, we move into deeper relationship with God. And that is how we begin to move to restore that image of God within each and every one of us. Amen.